Hi guys, and welcome back to another episode of Frozen Fortunes, the analysis stories. Um, so I figured, obviously, this is going to be a fairly long episode, as always. Try to settle in, try to do this in one take, so I do excuse my drink bottling, but you can imagine how long it can take if I had to keep stopping to edit, like, an hour-long video. It is, um... Mm gargantuan let's say so um here's how the league finished we kind of already know that we finished six points behind studios which isn't ideal considering some of the way we played earlier in the season but like a few people were saying use of Torre's inclusion um definitely did not help and i'll be looking to try and offload him in the summer um even if we got like 20 grand for the guy and a 50 percent of next sale clause i think i'd be pretty happy with that because it's really about what he because i think he could be good just not for us it's as simple as that we scored 72 goals in the league that's more than two a game but we did concede 76 which is more than anyone else by miles but anyway we'll have a look at the stats and take a look at that properly as well but there's one more thing i want to take a little look at and that is on this beautiful screen here the comparison screen it shows you how you rank for certain attributes compared to the rest of the league which i think is kind of cool so looking at goalkeepers, for example, you can see here that we've got the eighth best aerial reach on average of goalkeepers in this league. And you can also see where we've got the worst. So one on ones were the lowest. Uh, wait, joint lowest. It must be because it says 13th. Um, yeah, it's, it's weird, actually. It shouldn't say 13th, surely. Uh, we've got the lowest on agility as well. So that's why we're not particularly strong. Aerially, we're a lot better, but still um, only just about average on that one. Looking at the defense... We have the best jumping reach in the league, an average jumping reach of 13.17. But that is because I am prioritizing things like that when signing defenders. If they have good jumping reach and good heading, uh, I'm really quite interested in them. Um, heading's still a little bit on the low side, but at least we've got tall boys. Um, tackling, marking, pace are all bottom of the league for us. And that's an area we really do need to improve from our defenders. Having stronger, although we've got quite strong defenders, but the tackling and marking and being able to be a bit quicker really are in important. And I think that could really be an area that we'll look for, well, in summer we're not we'll have much choice i don't think it does depend on whether we turn pro or not i'm still holding out hope that the board might let us turn pro uh but then i will have to wade through the scouting system by myself so maybe not quite ideal midfielders um again we've got the best teamwork in the league which is quite nice to see and also stamina is pretty high on that one too vision is below average but only just again decisions long shots and passing as well um is very very low but it's you could throw a blanket over it, really, when you look at, like, FC Copenhagen. They're not that far ahead of us. It's just a couple of players with slightly lower passing stats, basically. Uh, finishing, we actually are above average. One of the best finishes in the league. And that kind of shows, I think. Um, unfortunately, our anticipation, heading, and long shots is very, very poor. Like, dreadfully poor. It really does seem to be an issue for us. And it shows in games when we have those damn long shots. Physicals, jumping reach is good. Balance is above average. Pace and, again, agility, very, very low. But that's for the entire team, bearing in mind. Mental attributes... Uh, aggression we're quite an aggressive team we're quite a determined team but that's by design but we do come bottom on a lot of other areas in this team um it's a shame we can't see things like consistent or oh, hang on and oh, that's concentration um that's very low as well though but we just don't have very good players bearing in mind technically um very very low on most things it shows you how far off the pace you are on a lot of these teams and yet we're still overachieving we won the goddamn cup this year anyway let's take a little look at the actual stats for the teams and the players and then we'll go and have a look at our own stats of course and uh, you guys have already got the um the the layouts that i use for the squad views and whatnot so if you do want them and you don't already have them they are in a link on the last video that i did of the analysis video so for the one at the end of season six right let's go to oh bravo was oh i didn't even notice that mariano bravo was top scorer in the league with 21 goals this year so that shows you something really doesn't it uh considering we've got a lot of bad areas in that we've got the top goal scorer in the league we've got 21 in the league um i I hope we can hang on to him. I'm going to try and extend his contract again, if we can do, because I think he's going to be key. Us hanging on to Mariano Bravo is so important um, because he's clearly a player that's loyal enough that wants to stay. But I do worry that... Um, because if we lose him, then we have to go to someone much younger again. And I want to have a striker that stays with us for a long time. And hopefully, if he's got the potential anyway, comes up with us and becomes something great for us in the future. You know, maybe score some goals in Europe for us later down the line. You never really know. Anyway, let's get actually into the stats. We'll do the team detailed ones first. So, average possession, of course, is massively lower than everyone else. No real surprises there. We actually scored six out of six penalties this year. Bravo grabbing all six of them. Uh, won quite a lot of penalties, though. Headers won. More than anyone else in the league, we won headers. We were great in the air winning those headers. Um, headers won ratio, not too bad actually as well, 61%. I think we used to be a bit lower on this one, so it's nice to see us really competing with teams uh, in the top flight and actually winning headers in the air. Obviously, you're not going to win a header on the ground, are you, Matt? Uh, yellow cards, still fairly high up on that one, but 
nowhere as bad as it could have been. Bromby really are a clean-ass team. Uh, red cards, we did definitely have... Yeah, we had three of them this year, actually, uh, which is much, much higher. I don't think we had a single one last year. But then when you're the top team in the league... Then again, Copenhagen had four of them themselves. Um, we can be a bit of a dirty bunch when we're struggling in games, that's for sure. Uh, the form one is totally irrelevant. Oh, well, we've gone way too far. Goals scored. 75 for Norgeland, 73 for Midgeland, and we got 72. So we were only, I mean, we had a sort of league winning or certainly championship group goal tally. Uh, it was just the defensive side of things where we struggled. Um, you know, we scored nine more goals in the league than the team that won the damn thing, to give you an idea. Cross completion. There we go. 18% second in the league. And that's in the top flight. We've got the second best cross completion, which is exactly where we wanted it to be. Bromby, clearly amazing from crosses. Vela, clearly not quite so good. Crosses completed were right up there as well with 194. Areas where we want to be good is cross completion and the number of crosses completed overall uh, and goals scored. These are areas we're doing very well in. Goals from corners. We've actually scored six times from corners, which is quite impressive. Direct free kicks. There were actually some scored this year, none of which were scored by us. From indirect free kicks, we only scored three, but it's better than nothing. Pass completion, obviously the lowest in the league by miles. Average of 61%. It doesn't matter. We're playing pewless football. We're playing ugly football, but it's working and we're scoring loads of goals. So who really cares? This is, We're going to have like a thousand less than other teams. In fact, we've completed like two and a half thousand passes less than anyone else in the league. Um, the, the, Copenhagen completed nearly double the number of passes as us this year, and I just don't care. Look at this. Chances created in the top flight of Denmark in our first season. 186 chances. That's better than the team that won the league. The best chance creation is so important. And shots on target ratio, best in the league, although joint with Kerger, which is surprising, actually. Um, but that, that's really, really good as well. We're creating chances and we're getting our shots on target. That makes me very, very happy to see that that's put, that sort of continued on into our time in the top flight shots on target still fairly high fourth overall on that one it's one of these situations where i think if we can just slowly get better and better defenders and improve in that area just like we did before where the attack got good for one year and that was good and then we looked solid but then the next year the defense started to catch up a little bit that's kind of what we need to do and i think that's kind of similar this year we're creating chances having lots of shots i think attacking wise we are a top three or four team from an attacking output person point of view the problem is from a defensive standpoint we're a 14th place team without a question of a doubt um it's kind of like think of it like american football almost where your offense and defense are kind of separate entities if you like uh, i think we are like i said attacking wise we are a championship group team comfortably but defensive wise we are a bottom of the table team and slowly i think as we get better defenders and start to work on that kind of part of the team that's an area which i think is slowly going to improve and i think having better midfielders is definitely going to help um because that you know they can drop the ball off to them we won't have to be under so much pressure all the time they can win the ball back in good areas i think that's going to help us definitely fouls against very very low because we never have the ball dribbles per game very very low because we never do any dribbling although i think if dosanya starts playing some more games for us he might find that uh, our dribbling one goes slightly further up than before conceded well i mean we've conceded 10 more goals than anyone else in the top flight you know to be a sort of championship group team we'd have to be conceding sort of i think if we could concede like maybe if we can see with the amount of goals that we score i think if we conceded like 55 goals we would comfortably be a championship side um championship group so to speak conceded from corners we conceded six times from corners this year which is a lot worse than it has been in previous years it's unfortunate but it's just a way of life um but zero direct free kicks and three so we conceded nine goals from set pieces this year it's better than it used to be when it was like 18 and whatnot. Um, bearing in mind, we're now a top flight side. So that's not too bad. But I think slowly over time, again, as we get better defenders, that should be an area which comes down quite considerably. Clean sheets. Uh, we had one. One clean sheet in the entire season. That was that nil-nil draw against Esbjerg, who amazingly had 11 clean sheets. So it's not all that surprising that the game ended that way. We weren't the most foully team in the league. Esbjerg and Silkeborg were both worse than us. We've won more tackles than anyone else. 933 tackles won this year. That's good to see. Tackles one ratio, I expect to be somewhere like eighth, probably. Uh, seventh overall. 75%, though. Still mid-table for tackles one. Uh, we'll have a look at who's actually winning those tackles and see where we can go with that. I'm interested to see if Augustin has been as good this year as he has been in previous years. Again, penalties conceded. Uh, yes, yeah, six penalties conceded. That's, again, a problem. You know, if you look at set pieces and penalties, that's like, well, 
15 goals that we've conceded right there that we could definitely work on and maybe get better defensively. Just cut that sort of stuff out. We could save ourselves 10 goals a season right there. Average attendance, obviously the lowest. Uh, then again, 1,500 people at home is brought up kind of by the 10,000 that we got for the all ball game. Uh, but still, 1,500 people for home games. I don't know what sort of attendances we're going to get next season because we will be back at home again um, in our new stadium in Nuke with a 10,000-seater stadium in Greenland. That's pretty dope. I imagine that the national team, not that they're a real national team, but well, we wanted to rent it from us. 11% of the stadium was full, but that, that kind of makes sense. We didn't have any sellouts either. Highest um, attendance overall was... See, we didn't have the lowest attendance overall. We had a 9,000 once. Uh, lowest attendance though, yeah. Uh, comfortably lowest with 947 people there. Net transfer spend. Overall, um, wait, we want... Oh, we can't actually do much about oh that's because of money brought in so copenhagen spent 1.23 million this season sbo actually gained uh five million pounds and that's because they sold a player uh oh god what's his name something like two back or something to chelsea for like six million quid so big money moves are on that one salary now this is fun our salary per annum is six hundred and eighty nine thousand pounds um which is still less than <laughs> that's still three times smaller than the nearest side and when you consider that Copenhagen is spending £24 million a season on salary, I mean, that's what, 10, no, not even 10, 40, 50 times more on wages than we are, and we've beaten them in the cup. I mean, we're still punching well above our weight this season, and I'm totally fine with that. Um, next year, if we do turn pro, things might turn a bit sour, because again, you do have to pay £750 a week to players that are on work permits, so that would double. So we'd have to be very picky about who we actually give work permits to. But it would we'll get to the point where a lot of players that we'd want to keep would already be earning more than that, so it's not quite so important on that one. Anyway, and have a quick sip of my drink as we switch over to the next screen. Okay, then. Games won, games lost. I mean... Unlikely we'll have any players on here. Yellow cards. Anyone on this one be interested to see? Yes, Rogers Jr. did get eight yellow cards this season. He was our most fouly man of the year, but it's not too bad, really, is it? He's got a few mistakes in him. Red cards. I think we got a few of those as well this year. Uh, yeah, Oli Ikkenen managed to get one on his... Well, not his debut, maybe. Actually, I think it was his debut. Augustine also got one, and someone else got one as well, as we know. Player of the Match Awards. We should have a couple on here. Gardner got five Man of the Match Awards. That's quite interesting, actually, that Stevie G got five Man of the Match awards. Um, that was all in that early part of the season, I think, apart from that game against Silk Ball right at the end. Despite Bravo being the top scorer with 21 goals, I don't know how many more he got than Steven Gardner. We can have a look at that in a bit. Uh, distance covered. Someone also pointed out that in that cup semi-final against um, Copenhagen, Carl Rogers Jr. ran 20 kilometers in that match. What an absolute lad. He could be an endurance runner. He and Moskutsa have covered more ground this season than any other player in this league. Moskutsa as well. Look at that. 470 kilometers he has run this season per game as well. They're right up there as well. Moskutsa runs an average of 15.37 per game. Traore actually used to get about quite a bit. Uh, he was a very bustly player, just not a very good player when he actually played. Uh, Santos also has a fairly good record on that. God, he's only 17 years old. Um, he really has come on leaps and bounds this year. I've been very, very impressed with him. Although we will have a look at his stats personally before we start to decide that. Average rating overall. Gardner actually has a higher rating overall than Mariano Bravo as well, which is strange to see. Svenny is in the top 20 as well, um, but that would have been dragged down massively by his performances towards the end of the year. We're going to have to have a long, hard look at his uh, ability. Obviously, I know he's going to be good, but I feel like he's just gone off the boil towards the end of the season. I know he's still very young, and hopefully next year he can come back with a fresh attitude because he's got to have, he's going to have competition for places. Salman Zahidi has put in some really good shifts towards the end of the season. It's given me a lot of reasons to think that I should prefer him over Jonas Fedingsen, quite frankly. But we'll look at that when we get to the individual stats. Headers won. We should have someone here. Augustine is up there as well as Fabian Moskutsa. That is great. That's what I want to see. Goals overall. Bravo, right. So Gardner got 16 goals in the league in 26 appearances. Gardner got 21 in 29. That's pretty damn good. And Svenningson got 11 in 17 starts. I'm looking at starts here mainly. So he still didn't do too badly. I don't suppose anyone else is on this list. No. Um, average minutes per game. Oh, sorry. Average minutes per goal. So that, that Talbleeb guy looks pretty damn good. Bravo's up there. Svenningson. Zahidi as well is on this list. as He's on this list too, which I think is quite important to note. Uh, he played nine games from the start and got five goals. So that's interesting. Uh, Bobby Duncan had the most shots. Bravo got 78 and Gardner got 71 shots. I'm interested to see who's had the most shots on target though. Uh, yeah, Gardner's actually hit the target more than Bravo. 
um, with 42 compared to Gardner, uh, Bravo's 39. Percentages, we should have some players up here. Gardner really does know how to smash a shot on target. That's what I would say about Steven Gardner. When he gets chances, he hits the target, and that often results in goals for him. 59% of shots on target in the top flight is great, whereas Bravo is down at 50%, which is still very, very good. Spending some nowhere to be seen. I'll be very interested to see as well what his is like. Uh, most team goals involved in. Look at that. Moscuza, 72 goals he's been on the pitch for. Bravo, Gardner, Safi as well has been involved in a lot of goals. Or not involved, but like on the pitch for. Uh, which does make you wonder how important it was for us to lose him this year. Best penalty taker in the league. Mariano Bravo scores six out of six from the spot. Brilliant stuff. I mean, that's really, really important. Assists. This is an area that... Um, God has got nine assists. Bravo has nine assists. Svenningsen has seven assists. It's all about the strikers for the assists this year. Key passes. Look at this. Key passes. Bravo, 81. Gardner, 64. Rogers Jr., 63. And Moskupsa, 62. Svenningsen on there. Santos on there. We make a lot of key passes. We've got six players in the top 20 for key passes. Uh, chances created. Jonas Svenningsen has created 27 chances. That is huge. That's really, really massive. I I'm actually amazed at how, mu how many chances he's created. Bravo and Gardner got 22 and 23 respectively. But Svensson, not Svensson, Svenningsen has played way less games than them and has created more chances during that period. That's very, very interesting. He seems to be more of a creative force than a pure goal scorer, although he does have goals in his game too. Pass completion, nobody on our team is going to be anywhere near that. Cross completion, right, please have someone on there. Bravo with 24, Svenningsen with 23. Um, unfortunately, our wingbacks didn't quite make the cut this time, which is a shame. I'd like to think they're not too low, but the fact that they're on attacking mostly this year means that they are going to be crossing more often. So I feel like that might actually lead to them getting less completed, but more crosses completed overall, just less as a ratio. Dribbles per game, we were never going to have anyone on here at all, were we? Offsides, Gardner gets offside a fair amount, as does the rest of our strikers. No surprises there. Team conceded, uh, well, we were never going to have anyone that on. Tackles per game. Rogers Jr. and Moskuts are both flying along on tackles. They've been absolutely rocky. Uh, they've just been rocks this year. Mistakes leading to goal. Augustin and Moskuts have made three each, uh, which is a slight problem. Rogers Jr. makes a lot of mistakes, but only one conceded turned into a goal. That is a lot of mistakes. But I think that's partly due to the position that we play those guys in. They're in a position where it's very difficult for them to not make mistakes sometimes, and it's not too much of a worry for me when you consider how well we play generally. Key tackles overall. I'm going to have another sip of my drink. Perez, oh god, we miss him so much. Uh, and Aldo Safi, uh, right up there. But that's what you want to see, really. Like Safi clearly is a safe pair of hands. Key headers, uh, Moscuta obviously up there. Ooh, Garner's as well with the key headers as well. Interceptions. Augustine should be fairly high on this one. There we go. Although Moscuta has actually done pretty damn well for the headers as well. But not headers, interceptions. Augustine is always going to be on here. I, I really can't wait to see uh, what his stats are like compared to everyone else. Headers one. Uh, ratio. Mascoot's 86% one in the air. That is very, very good. Rogers Jr. and Augustine. It's weird, really, when your two wingbacks are actually winning more headers than your two, uh, your three centre-backs. It just uh, shows that we do need to... I really, really hope that we get some kind of solid defender come in during this window. Um, because I, I don't know what it's going to be like. If we were to turn pro, I don't know whether these amateur signings would be able to... Because we've got like 500 of them queued up still. And I don't know if we turn pro. Does that just cancel all those amateur signings? Or would they still somehow come in? Because the way it works at the moment is because we're part-time, I can offer them amateur contracts. But if we're, if we're completely professional, I wouldn't be able to. So I don't know whether they'd actually be able to join this. So I'm worried about that. Because if we were to turn fully professional, I'd have to go and scout people. And I don't know really what I'm doing with that, to be perfectly clear. Uh, shots blocked. Right. Augustine Safi up there again. Uh, Rogers Jr. Ikkenen actually blocked a lot of shots in a very short space of time. Pretty pleased with that. Conceded, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, I mean, not even in the top... Th Wait, what? Why have we only got 13 goal... Oh, minimum of 21 games played, I see. Uh, clean sheets. Uh, <laughs> not going to be on that one either, are we? Saves held. Uh, Garcia has held more saves than Castaneda and saves parried. Garcia has also parried more than Castaneda, but he's probably featured in less games. 13 appearances to 16, so it's not that different. Anyway, um, let's move over to the actual stats screen, the proper squad stats screen, so we can have a look at things properly. I'm just going to have another uh, look at my goal. Look at this. We've got some players on uh, £1,200 a week. Yusuf Torre is one of our highest paid players in this squad, and it's one of the reasons that I kind of want to get rid, because if you look at value-based, like he's on a lot of money, and, well, I mean, let's face it, he, he's, he's not doing, he's not justifying that w the wage that he's on. Um, so even if we got like 20k for him from someone in the summer, I, I'd be pretty pleased with that. Anyway, let's turn over and go on to custom and we want, 
uh, we want to start with goalkeeper analysis. Right. Let's uh, go to goalkeepers. Blah, 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 blah. Right. Keepers. It's basically between Gaston Garcia and Can Castaneda, really. Because, I mean, Kingsley Thomas played maybe, what, three or four games? Really wasn't. And he conceded a lot of goals um, in those period. Or was that conceded? That was team goals, to be fair. We actually scored more. No, we didn't. Never mind. Right. So, this is quite an important one to look at. Goals scored with him in the team. We scored lots more goals with, Cast uh, with Garcia in the team. Uh, but we did also concede more goals with Castaneda in the team. So I feel like we've got better defensively with Castaneda in the team. But it's also, I mean, it's a question of like how much that matters. So I think what you've got to look at is, this is, uh, we're going all bloody like soconomics here about this. But I think this is important to notice. Uh, they have one clean sheet each as well. I don't know when Gaston Garcia's one. That must have been in the cup or something. Um, I think it was actually. So he... Brrr, so we scored 2.64 goals per game with Gaston Garcia in the team, um, which meant that it was 25 and this was... So 80, 0.89 of a goal more per game with Gaston Garcia in the team. However, I think having Gaston Yeda in the team saved us more than that in goals conceded. And that's kind of what we want. We want a net positive as far as goal difference goes. Um, I think he saved us what? What's that? Like, you think about it, 89, 96. So yeah, 0.95. So we, we <laughs> it's very, very tight. Um, so we were scoring 0.89 of a goal less with Castaneda in the team, but we were also conceding 0.95 of a goal less with Castaneda in the team. So it's like a net gain of 0.05 goals, which isn't much, I grant you, but it's still worth an extra goal over a season, uh, basically. Um, so saves tipped. Castaneda, they're basically the same on that one. Castan Garcia does tend to parry more than Castaneda um, in a shorter space of time. At, but he does hold more. It seems like he's had to face more shots in general. Points per game, we've gained slightly more points with Castaneda in the team, ever so slightly. And I think that's kind of key. And that plays out the fact that, you know, it is a slight net gain on goals. And it's led to that just a fraction of a point more. Uh, conceded is fairly same between them. We've won more games with Castaneda in goal. And, well, conceded per 90 minutes. It, it's, it's, well, that's basically the same stat as that one, isn't it, really? Um... So I, I personally think that persisting with Castaneda into next season is probably a sensible decision. Also, because as you can see, Gaston Garcia is really starting to hit a ceiling uh, with his ability. And G Castaneda has a better personality too for things. Um, you know, he's nearly as good aerially. Um, not quite as good with his throwing, but we don't really do a lot of throwing anyway. Tendency to punch is slightly higher, but it's fairly similar. Um, rushing is, he's better at rushing out. He's got slightly worse reflexes. He's a bit better one-on-one. -on -one. His kicking is a little bit poorer, um, like noticeably poorer, and that does certainly come into play. His handling is also poorer. He's nowhere near as eccentric, uh, which I'm not too bothered about, to be perfectly honest. Um, his command area is a little bit lower, as is that. So in some ways, he's probably a worse goalkeeper, but he's actually performed slightly better, and I feel like he has more room to grow. So I definitely feel like unless someone amazing comes in, um, Castaneda will almost certainly be our first choice keeper for next year. I'm still a little unsure about Kovacic, but you can see again, the potential ceiling's not there. Uh, whereas Castaneda has got a lot more room to improve and he is younger. So I'm tempted to say that Castaneda is definitely going to be first choice keeper unless someone amazing comes in next year. He's got that fairly professional personality too, which you know I like to keep around the team to hope the, help the overall team improve. Right, let's look at wingbacks now. I'm just going to have another sip of my drink while I change it. So don't worry about the slurping noises. I do apologize, but you know how it is. Right, wing back analysis. Now we know where to find the bad boys this time. Um, so it's on defensive midfielders, but left and right sided. So it's essentially just these two, isn't it? Really, uh, we've got Cock and Ramich, who are sort of the understudies, but they're just not. They're just not there. These two are absolute gods. Like genuinely, they're two of the best players in this team. Um, and it's just as well, really. Like, look, two of our best players are in those two wing back roles, which are so hard to find players for. They're both 19 years old but I've got bags and bags of potential. I really hope we can hang on to these guys for a few years. It's going to be tough in the summer, though, but I hope that we can convince them to stay. Hopefully, Stephen Gardner's position in the squad could potentially help us. It's weird, though, that despite all that and them being on good money, their values aren't that high. Maybe it's just because the position isn't that sought after. Um, now, what I'm not really doing here, I'm not really looking at, to replace them because next year, these two will be our starting wingbacks. There's no way in hell that someone is going to come in in the summer that is better than either of these two for the positions they play in. It's just so, so unlikely. So what we're kind of looking at is just who's performed better out of the two of them this year. And again, that isn't totally fair because 
they've played with different players in front of them and also particularly with the midfield section uh Muscoots on the right hand side has had the advanced playmaker on his side of the pitch whereas Carl Rogers Jr has had the attacking based central midfielder who's going to be pushing forward a little bit more so yeah we'll see how we go so points per game we've won more points per game with Carl Rogers Jr in the team which is very interesting actually and conceded less goals with him in the team tackles one ratio is a little bit lower uh fact, it's noticeably lower but he does complete more passes he plays more key passes per 90 minutes, uh, but makes less interceptions. Headers won, they're basically much of a muchness, although Muscuzzo wins a few more overall. Games win ratio, they're pretty much right there. Now, Rogers Jr. does seem to be able to dribble a bit more than Moscuzzo, which is interesting because they both have eight dribbling, yet he completes way more dribbles, like nearly double per game. Um, so I wonder why that is. Where does he really excel over, over Moscuzzo that allows him to do that, really? Uh, his acceleration is a slightly higher, and his teamwork is a little bit higher. But other than that, his decision-making, perhaps he knows when to dribble. It's negligible, but it is certainly noticeable that that is a thing. Um, Cross is completed. 18 and 17%. I'm pretty pleased with that. Those two getting solid records of uh, crosses completed in the top flight, particularly playing on attacking where they're going to be crossing more, which means that they're going to be maybe not making quite as many good crosses. Uh, chances created 16 and 17 Fairly solid there. Chances created per 90 minutes, almost dead even. Moscuzzo has got a couple more assists, which is weird, considering he completes less of his crosses, but more of them do, do turn into goals. Average rating is slightly higher from him as well, probably because of the assists, but he has made three mistakes that led to goals compared to Carl Rogers Jr. Um, so that's that's an interesting one as well. Um, he's technically the slightly better player according to this. He's also got that professional personality as opposed to fairly professional. So Rogers Jr. is a slightly better tackler, which is played out in the fact that he has a slightly better passing, um, basically dead even, marking dead even, dribbling dead even. Rogers Jr. has a slightly better crossing stat, uh, which might account for that 1% better that he's getting. Uh, stamina, Moskutsa is slightly better. They've both got very good stamina, which shouldn't really affect him too much. Acceleration is a little bit quicker. Uh, Moskutsa has got slightly better work rate as well, uh, which is nice to see. Teamwork is a little bit worse, though. Uh, so there's that. Positioning is fairly even. Off the ball, Rogers Jr. is much, much better. Or, you know, he's certainly definitely better than Moskutsa. Determination, they're both very high. Decisions are both very good. And is that concentration? I can never remember that one. Is that concentration? Yeah, they're both very, very good on concentration. I just kind of wanted to take a look at them. These guys will be starting for us next year. Um, I have a feeling that they're potentially going to be club legends. I mean, imagine if we lost one of these guys. I'm going to try not to. I really hope we don't lose either of these two guys in the summer. I feel like if we come back next year in our first game of the season, Rogers Jr. on the left and Moscuzzo on the right, I will be ecstatic with that because these two are two of the most important cogs in this team and keeping them in this team and playing because we've got no one uh, that can really back them up at the moment. And it's a real problem. Thank God they've stayed fit for the most of the most of the season really so an area we definitely do need to look to strengthen in though is that area with the uh wingbacks right let's move on to the proper midfield uh, no let's do the center backs now of course what we're talking about uh so we want defenders we want we do obviously have um left backs and right backs available uh in the team it's just that they're not good for the i mean I think when we turn pro, it'll be easier to take a right back and a left back and turn them into a wing back. So I'm not quite as worried about that now uh, if we can turn pro. But because obviously they'll have more time to train it, they'll be professional, which means we'll have better match fitness and whatnot. Uh, hopefully that will help. Right, so let's go to the centre backs. Centre backs? Centre backs. Right, we've got quite a few that have played minutes for us this year. Safi, Augustin, Roland, Coutinho, not really, although we can play there. Ikonen, Ruddy and Lubacic really are the ones I'm looking at. Um... Some of them haven't played enough, but we're mainly concentrating on these ones here. But these guys have played enough for me to consider them and maybe have a look at them for next season as well. So, team conceded per 90 minutes. We conceded the most uh, with Aldo Safi in the team. Augustin up there as well. We conceded the least with Roland and Lubacic towards the end. However, most of the games they played were almost certainly against worse quality opposition. So, that is that to take into account. Um... It's definitely important to mention, I think. Tackles per 90 minutes. Safety's right up there, Roland and Lubacic. So it's it's definitely worth noting, though, that Ruddy and Ikonen are well off the pace on that one. Because um, my next my plan for the lineup next year for the centre-backs, using the existing squad anyway, would be Augustin in the centre, uh, Safety on the left, and Lubacic on the right, or Nick Roland to replace someone on the left-hand side if worst comes to worst and someone like Safi was to leave the club because he is very highly rated and I'm constantly getting offers in Burnley came in for him in the January transfer window but I did manage to convince him to stay which is good um, so that's kind of a backup plan there anyway uh, tackles 
one ratio. Quite an important stat. Ikenen good with that, but safety also good. Uh, Basquez, Ruddy, Augustin. Lubacic doesn't seem to win enough tackles, and that does worry me a little bit. Uh, whereas Roland is sort of within the margin of error there. Augustin certain, certainly right where we want him, around the 80% mark, along with that Aldo safety. It's sort of right in that kind of sweet spot. Safety, the oldest defender that we have at the club as well, uh, being 20 years old, the elder statesman of the defence. Points per game. This is an interesting one now. Lubacic, again, 1.65. The lowest is Ikonen. Augustin's played probably the most games, though, along with Safi. Uh, but we have one more points per game, quite considerably more, with Aldo Safi in the team. So his absence over the past few matches, I think, has genuinely made a difference as well. So Augustin and Safi are very, very important. But we said that last year. I kept thinking, nah, it's not about Augustin. He's bad. He's not. He's genuinely good. And we'll see that, hopefully, when we come to the interceptions part of this. Um, points one per game. Right, passes. Lubacic, Augustin's up there. Safi, Roland, Curtin. So these players, it's mostly here. They're all, you could throw a blanket over almost all of them. Curtin we can ignore because he only played that substitute appearance in the very final game. Mistakes. We're more interested in mistakes per 90 minutes, really. Um, but Safi and Augustin are both up there. Roland up there. And actually, he has made quite a lot of mistakes considering the amount of games he's played. Um, that is a, a slight worry. Mistakes did into goals. Augustin has made three and none of the others have. But he does play in that central sort of position that does leave him a bit more open. So uh, it's, it's a tough one. Key tackles. Safi again, look at the number of key tackles he's made compared to Augustine and Roland and people like that. He's just a king. Uh, key headers, Augustine is the man for that. I, I really want to have a, another big, big centre back guy that can win headers in the air because that's an area where um, Augustine is the main man for winning headers in the back four, as you'll see when we get to the ratios and whatnot. But I want to have someone that's a bit taller because Safi isn't the tallest. Perez wasn't the tallest, but Augustine can win those headers. And we need to have centre backs that can do that, to be honest. Got good jumping reach on a lot of them, but our heading stats are generally quite poor. We definitely need some big lads at the back for that kind of thing. Key passes. Uh, per 90 minutes, Coutinho, obviously because he's a midfielder, we can ignore that. Safi right up there, Augustine as well. Roland a little bit low. It's basically a case of Safi, Augustine and one other um, as our first choice centre-backs next year. It has to be. Uh, Safi's excellent, Augustine is excellent, but I feel like there's room for one more. Be that Roland, Ljubicic, Ruddy, Ikonen, maybe someone new, hopefully someone new. I don't know. I just feel like these guys... I mean, thankfully, there's still lots of potential in these players. And that's what I really like. There's still lots of room for them. Lots of good personalities. Fairly professional. Professional. Fairly professional. Professional. Resolute for Aldo Safi too, which is mwah, beautiful stuff. Right. Um, right. Interceptions per 90 minutes. Ready for this? Augustine's bound to win this. Look at that. Although Julian Ruddy, not bad as well when he has played for us. Aldo, uh, Augustine, 6.19 interceptions per game playing in that central role. Safi does well as well on there too. Lubacic, very, very low. Roland is making a good shout to be that player. What foot is Aldo Safi? Is he right or left footed? Either. Okay. So maybe put Roland on the left side of the defense and move Safi over to the right side of the defense. So Roland's playing on his correct foot and maybe he'll perform better and have Safi there. It's looking like Nicky Roland is probably my... my Sort of third choice. Uh, headers one ratio. Well, I mean, Ruddy also wins a lot of headers. What's Roland's like? 77. Uh, it's better than Safi as well. So Augustine, of course, 83. So Roland's kind of splitting the difference and looks like the guy that could probably, if we don't get someone better in the summer, he could be the one that nails down that position on the left side of our defense along next to Carl Rogers Jr. Uh, games one ratio. Again, this one's going to be a bit deceptive because, you know, um, because of the way that certain players play towards the end of the season and stuff like that. Uh, distance one, we're not really too bothered about that. So personalities and whatnot. Hum. So I'm thinking, looking at this, technical ability. Who's got the best technique? <sighs> Safety's decent technique. Roland, I mean, Augustine's got very poor technique, but it clearly hasn't affected him too badly. Tackling. Safety has good tackling, and that's important. Roland's got decent tackling. Augustine is fairly low, but he's not that much lower than anyone else, really. Uh, passing. Which is quite an important stat for some of our defenders. Roland has good passing and might be able to get some balls off. Uh, whereas Safi's only got a six and Augustine's only got a five. Augustine is a very no-nonsense defender. Don't expect him to be playing exquisite passes. I think having Roland as an option for that certainly could help. Particularly getting him on his correct foot. Nobody's an amazing pass for the ball to be fair. Marking. Roland again. 13 marking. Safi with 12. 
and Augustine is down at 10. So Roland could be really solid in that role. But you notice Curtin is appearing at the top of quite a few of these lists as well. So maybe that, I mean, look, he's got decent passing. His tackling is uh, sort of middle of the road. He's got decent technique. Um, how's his heading? Pat Curtin, best heading as well. 16 heading. Tell you what, maybe there's room for Pat Curtin next year. What foot is he? Please tell me he's on a good foot. He's left footed as well, which means he could slide perfectly on that left side of things. Um, he could be the one here. What about first touch? A pretty, well, actually, it's still fairly high. Aldo Safey's got a better first touch than him, but Augustine doesn't. Neither does Nicholas Rowland. Um, so again, worth looking at. Strength. How strong is Pat Curtin? Strength is 13. It's not as good. In fact, it's better than Rowland, better than Augustine, better than Safey, although it's actually level with those. Garner's very, very strong, but doesn't quite have the air, other areas of the team. Um, jumping reach. How are we doing here? Uh, Gustin, you know, 15. Pat Curtin again. It's, it's, it's 12. He's still right in there. I th I'm wondering if maybe Pat Curtin's the man we want on that side of things as well. Um, vision. Vision's not super important, uh, but Safey's got decent vision for himself. Curtin's okay. Uh, Augustine, still better than Roland though. That, that's kind of important there as well. Positioning. Lubitsch is up there as well. Roland, decent positioning. Pat Curtin right in behind with Safey and Augustine though. He's certainly matching these guys already. Uh, despite being a tad younger than some of them. So not too bothered about that. Determination. Safety's right up there as well. Pat Curtin's got good determination too. Augustine a little on the low side. Decisions. Augustine right up there. Pat Curtin a little bit low on the decisions. Um, compared to who our other sort of first choice types of player. That might be one area where he's slightly off the pace. But he's not super much worse. Super much? He's not much worse than Nicky Rowland in that area. Concentration, how are we doing? Pat Curtin still ranking fairly well against their opponents uh, or other players. Composure. Curtin again finds himself ranking quite near the top. Bravery. He's got 18 bravery. He's a brave, brave man, and we sometimes need that kind of thing. His anticipation is 10, which is... Uh, wait, what the hell? Oh, I must have moved it. Oops. Uh, his anticipation is 10, which again puts him middle of the road. I'm thinking actually at the moment that maybe with Augustine in the middle, Safety on the right, and maybe Pat Curtin on the left-hand side with Roland to come off the bench as an option for us next year, might not be such a bad shout, but I'm still holding out hope that we get someone better to come in. But at the moment, I'm thinking maybe Pat Curtin could be ready to step up to the first team. Uh, he's also got a fairly professional personality too, uh, which uh, is better than Roland's ambitious, I believe, or it certainly feels like it to me. And then we'd have a full backline of good personalities with resolute and fairly professional ones in there too. I I'd be pretty pleased with that next year. But we're one area of the team where we are not lacking in squad depth is our centre-backs. We've got lots of them. And lots of them that can play fairly well for us when they're called upon. Hopefully next year they'll get slightly better though. Right, let's move on to the centre midfielders before we sort of cap things off. Oh, and I've not managed to mess up any of the... Uh, I've actually not messed up any of these things yet. We've actually done it all perfectly so far. So, central midfielders. Did anyone sort it by minute? See if anyone out of these that wasn't in this list. Uh, a few guys... Oh, actually, wait. Uh... I don't know. I feel like all the important ones are are listed here. It certainly seems like it to me. Anyone missing? Alex Ott played a few games, but I don't know. Any under-19 guys? No, I think we're probably all right uh, to go with these guys for now. So, minutes. Ironically, Yosef Torre actually played the most minutes, but that's because we lost Sergio Santos um, in, and then he came back. So, read that. Read into that what you will. Assist per 90 minutes. Coutinho. Uh, interesting. Vera, we can ignore. Traore actually did provide some assists. He provided more assists per 90 minutes than Sergio Santos did, which is interesting. Um, overall assists, Coutinho created four assists. I tell you what, Davide Coutinho, I dropped him out of the team and I can't remember why. Because he seemed to be, I mean, looking at this, seems to be like a decent lad. Uh, still got contract till next year. He's on low money. Hmm. Okay, we'll see how all the rest of this pans out. But he got four assists in only 11 appearances. Like, his assist per 90 minutes is fairly high compared to some of the others. Uh, certainly better than Sergio Santos, that's for sure. Average rating in game. Sergio Santos clearly is offering things elsewhere in this team. It's undeniable. Chances created. Um, Pavel Kovalchek created seven chances. Santos only four. Coutinho three. Um, so, yeah. I mean, Traore again is right in there. Chances created per 90 minutes. It should be fairly similar. Uh, Kowalczyk, much, much higher. Santos, still better than Traore. Uh, still worse than Traore. But I don't know, something about Traore when he's in the team, just something didn't feel right elsewhere. That's all I can really put it down to. Dribbles per game. Uh, Santos does dribble more than other players, and that certainly creates a lot of space for us when we need it. 
And it's an area of the team I... Uh, I wouldn't mind trying to get him back on loan again next season as well, to be perfectly honest. Like, I feel like there's room for him. Uh, can we all try all columns? Yeah. Lots more stuff off the screen here, which is going to be a pain later on. But I feel like if we could get him back on loan next year, like, he's a solid, solid player. Already one of the best players we've got. So if we could find a way to get him back on loan and Bayern don't mind, um, that reminds me, I need to make sure we can try and organize that friendly to get some extra money in from Bayern. Try and bring him back next year as well. Because I think he's a key cog in that midfield that we don't really want to lose. Particularly if I'm getting planning on getting rid of Traore. Because I feel like it would be Santos and either Coutinho or Kovalchik playing in the other role that we've got. Um, dribbles per game. Yeah, so headers one. Traore does win a lot of headers in the midfield. Understandable. Uh, because he's a fairly tall lad. He's clearly offering some things. He's just not offering the things I want him to be offering. Seems to be the way things go. Games one. Uh, this is interesting, you know. 46% of our games with Torre in the team, we have won, along with Coutinho. Uh, and it's much, much lower with Kowalczyk. It, it's interesting to see that, really, considering how bad we were in games when Torre played. That's very, very strange. Mm, maybe he is worth keeping, but it depends. I don't know. He's on a lot of money, and I just don't think his contribution to the team is worth £1,200 a week at the moment. I, I just don't think that's... I don't think it's worth that amount of money. When you look at what other players around us on, we've got Santos is free, Coutinho is on like 120, and Kovalchik's probably on the same. Uh, yeah, 120. So all our other players are on like £120 a week, and Treyar is earning 10 times that, and he's certainly not giving us 10 times that in terms of contribution to the team. So I think it is about maximising that, what we get. Headers 1 ratio, we already did that. Headers 1 per 90 minutes. Treyar is massively higher than everybody else. So he's definitely given us another option in that midfield for winning headers. Maybe we could find a tall midfielder key pass uh, sorry interceptions as well he's he's up there um but what's he like creatively though that that's kind of what we're looking for key passes i mean santos has actually got more key passes but torre ah oh, i don't know he's he's done all right like then again key passes per 90 minutes right now let's start to come into this a bit more sensibly for creative output it's lower than kovalchik lower than Coutinho, and much lower than santos so he's the lowest performing in terms of actual creative output for key passes of our midfielders key tackles he's right up there because he's a ball winning midfielder pass completion um lower than Coutinho, lower than santos but not lower than kovalchik interesting points per game we've won more points with Coutinho and traore in the team than we have with kovalchik and santos that's strange shots on target ratio zero percent for Sergio Santos. Um, that's not really what we want them for. Now, obviously, Traore, you'd expect his tackles one ratio, considering he's a ball-winning midfielder, to be high, but it's not. Coutinho wins 80% of his tackles. I wonder why. I wonder what his tackling stat's like. I don't think I've got it listed on here, actually. Uh, no, we don't. That's, what's Coutinho's tackling like? It's only six, but he wins a lot of tackles. Whereas you look at someone like Toure, who's supposed to be good for tackling, uh, with his 13 tackling, and he's not really completing many tackles. It's not that much better than someone like Pavel Kowalczyk, whose tackling is six. So, Triori seems to be winning headers for us. And that's about it. His midfield contribution. That, that genuinely seems to be what he's done for us, is win headers, basically. Um, maybe I'm being a bit harsh. Tackles one per game. K Kowalczyk wins more. Uh, Coutinho wins more. Santos wins less, but he's always played as an advanced, pl uh, yeah, an advanced playmaker, so he wouldn't. Whereas Triori is often played in the other one, again, has underperformed there. Team conceded per 90 minutes. Uh, so the least goals conceded with Coutinho in the team, Santos, Kowalczyk, Traore. Again, we've conceded more goals with him in the team. I think I was letting that kind of jade me a little bit on his, some of his earlier contributions. Also, look at his average rating as well. Santos, good. Kowalczyk, Coutinho. Traore is the lowest average rating as well. His performances in general aren't good enough. And I don't think keeping him next year, if we can get an offer of like 20k... Ship him on, get the 50% of next selfie clause, because I feel like he could be good, just not for us. Santos, I want to try and get back. Kovalchik and Coutinho, it's a little bit loose in this midfield period. It'd be nice to get someone like a Juan, a Juan Shizzy type of player come back in like we did before and actually get some solid boys in that midfield. But Santos, hopefully, if we can get him back, which you never know, because he's not going to play for Bayern, it is likely to happen since he's come through here. Um, maybe if we can even get him for two years, that'd be quite good. If we could try and get him for two years, but one would be fine. Um, just to continue his development be a nice playmaker. Hopefully you can get a full season out of him this time. Well, you know, a full season of stats anyway. And see how he does. Because he will keep improving. You know, he's fairly professional. He's got a good personality as well. Uh, Traore does too. Kowalczyk and Coutinho's spirited and realist personalities. 
I would prefer a professional one uh, in that midfield role to go alongside Santos. So maybe if someone comes in, that's something to look at. But I don't think there's anyone particularly waiting in the wings, ready to sort of overthrow them just yet. We've got other options. There's Andorra, McGarry Watson, um, Jurkovic, who is, again, he's got the driven personality. That's good. Um, potential for maybe someone like Surgord, although I don't think that's actually his main role, is it? Can he just play there? Oh, no, he he basically is that kind of midfielder. Um, but uh, Atienza, Castillo, Ricardo, Ricardo here, uh, Olison, Benson. Remember Dan Benson? Uh, still here. He's not even on a real contract, I don't think. No, 23 years old. And Sordan Diamosa, of course, is still at the club, uh, although he is listed for loan, or has he been out on loan? Uh, no, he's listed for loan. I should probably get him some loan football because he is still in contract, although I think his contract finishes this summer. Yeah, it does. Right, so I'm actually kind of happy, but I feel like if there's a one position that we need to strengthen, really, it's that central attacking midfield role. Um, sorry, central midfielder on attacking. That role is one that really does need to be boosted. Uh, particularly if Toure leaves in the summer. And Santos, hopefully we can get him back. If not, then things could start to get a little bit more dicey. But I feel like Coutinho could do a job there, uh, really. Anyway, let's move on to the strikers, because I'm, I'm kind of excited about looking at our strike force today. And just sort of seeing... Um, well, attackers, right. Okay, so, minutes played. We kind of want anyone from sort of... Hmm... Under-19 squad, not relevant. B-team. Who's from the B-team? Is that Dan Yazzi? Okay, so Dan Yazzi. We'll leave it on uh, because I kind of want to keep Dan Yazzi in here because I, I want to see what his contributions are like because he's not started many games, but he's played well in the games. So, most minutes for us is Mariano Bravo. Garner up there. Svenningsen just in behind and then Zahidi after that. So, team conceded per 90 minutes. This is not really that important, but if there's a giant swing, you'll know. Yazzi, we've conceded a lot of goals with him in the team, whereas someone like Svenningsen not quite so much. Uh, Gardner, Bravo, and Zahidi, kind of similar. Svenningsen, we do seem to be minorly better defensively, but I I'm not sure how well that really works. Tackles one ratio. Uh, Svenningsen does win a lot of tackles. 85% of his tackles have been won, whereas Zahidi, 60, Gardner, 60, and Bravo, 79. Actually, to be fair, Bravo is pretty good with his tackles as well. Uh, Zahidi and Gardner aren't really doing a job. Svenningsen does seem to be more of a sort of workhorsey type of striker who can finish, but is better at creating stuff. Uh, maybe. Maybe that's what he needs. Maybe he's the new St. Brendan. St. Svenningsen. Um, so, yeah, tackles per 90 minutes. Shots on target per 90 minutes. Um, Svenningsen, 3.49 per 90 minutes. Uh, that's a lot. Dan Yassi's up there. Zahidi's slightly off the pace on that one. Dosanya even lower. Um... Vera even lower than that. Perich is the most, um, but most of that was in that one damn game where he just could not hit a back donkey's barn door with a banjo or whatever the expression is. That certainly wasn't it. Um, possession, right. Yeah, so shots on target. Zahidi, 59. Gardner, 59. Bravo, 50. Yazzi, 47. Um, where's Fennington? 48. So Zahidi certainly knows how to hit the target when he gets into his positions. And... I can't fault what Simon Zahidi's done for us since he's come in. He's been excellent. He might be one of these players, a bit like a Jose Angel uh, Gonzalez, that comes in for a bit, does well, and as a result of that, earns himself a massive move away uh, for good money and like friendlies and stuff like that. He could be the, that type of player for us. But I don't really think we're in a position uh, with the squad depth at the moment to be selling anybody like that. I honestly think that keeping the front three as they are with someone like Sven uh, with Svenningsen and Yazi and those types of players and Dosanya in there, that's what we need. We really need three first teamers and then three really solid backups with some youngsters coming through behind that because we play so many damn strikers that's the way it kind of works for me shots per 90 minutes Gardner, Svenningsen, Zahidi, Bravo takes a few less shots but he often plays in the middle uh, whereas these three almost always play either side of him points per game who have we won the most points with well there you go um Zahidi 1.45 points per game Gardner 1.41 Bravo actually the lowest so Svenningsen certainly isn't like massively off the pace uh, when you compare to someone like Perich or Vera or even Yazzie, those three, you can clearly see the difference. Uh, Dosani has not played enough for me to take that into account. But Zahidi is definitely in the conversation for a starting spot, really. Uh, those four, you could throw a blanket over them. One of them is going to have to be dropped and it's tough to work out who. Um, it, I mean, it, for all I know, it could always end up being Steven Gardner, you know, for next year. If he doesn't improve and starts to sort of stagnate while the others are improving around him, then it will be Steven Gardner that gets dropped. It's as simple as that. Like, I think he's still a right-footed player, isn't he? Right only, and he's done amazingly on that left-hand side. So I don't think it really matters what foot you're on. But if we could get a good left-footed striker, then that would be great. Uh, someone like Zahidi, there you go. He's left-footed only. So really, he'd have to play in Gardner's role. So maybe 
a front line of Zahidi, Bravo and Svenningsen for next season to start things off with, with Gardner being a bit part player. Uh, but we'll see. We'll have a look at the actual contributions this year. Pass completed. Uh, Zahidi wins, makes a lot of passes. So does Svenningsen. Bravo a little bit lower. Gardner a little bit lower. But again, very, very close. Key passes per 90 minutes. Svenningsen higher than the rest. And But again, it's so, so close between a lot of these guys. Mariano Bravo has made 81 key passes. Svenningsen, Zahidi. Again, it's all very similar. Right. Headers won. Yazzie wins a decent number of headers. Uh, Gardner 44, Svenningsen 37, Zahidi 30, and Bravo 26. Considering he's a target man uh, by trade, but he's just not good enough in the air for that one. Um, Gardner, that's one thing he can do, is he does seem to have a little bit more ability in the air. God, if we could just get a good striker who was tall, like really decent tall, uh, that would make such a difference to this team playing through the middle. Uh, goals per 90 minutes. Bravo, obviously highest. Yazzie up there too. Uh, Zahidi's actually a little bit lower. His output is not as good as perhaps I think it is. Uh, that's something worth noticing. Games 1 percentage. Zahidi the highest, but right in there with everyone else. Bravo actually the lowest. Uh, fouls against. Gardner seems to draw a lot of fouls. Dribbles per game. Uh, Svenningsen dribbles quite a fair bit. Zahidi dribbles quite a fair bit. Bravo, not so much, and neither does uh, Gardner. Weirdly, Dosanya, despite me bringing him in for his dribbling ability, which is very, very good from what I can remember... Uh, although, yeah, 15 dribbling. One, probably the best dribbler in this entire team. Just didn't show off in that in the appearance that he made for us so far. Um, cross completion. Interesting one. So Sunning's got good cross completion. Bravo, 24. Svenningsen, 23. 16. And then Gardner all the way down at 13. That's noticeable. Uh, the fact that Gardner's cross completion is so much lower than his compatriots in that team. Bravo, much, much higher. Zahidi's certainly not as good as Svenningsen and Bravo, but he's much, much better than Gardner. It's starting to make me wonder if... And he's been playing on his wrong foot, remember? He's been playing on the right-hand side as a left-only player. So a lot of cutting back inside, potentially. Maybe getting him on that left-hand side instead with that pace. Hmm. Could be something to look at for next season, potentially. Chances created per 90 minutes. Svenningsen right up there. Zahidi up there, too. Gardner there. Uh, and then Bravo right in behind. Average rating overall. Gardner, Bravo, Svenningsen. Uh, Zahidi a little bit off the pace of that one. Svenningsen still has performed well. So he's definitely contributing to the games. Minutes per goals. Uh, so, Zahidi's minutes per goal. No, wait. Yeah, it's kind of what we're looking for here. It's a bit, bit confusing. Bravo, Vera, Yazzi, Gardner, Svenningsen. Hmm. Assists. Bravo and Gardner with nine each. Svenningsen with seven. Only three for Zahidi, so less assists as well. But he has played less games than all the others. That, that To be fair to him. Assists per 90 minutes is probably a better reflection. Yazzi, great for assists. Svenningsen, 40 per game. Gardner, 0.38. Bravo, 0.33 and Zahidi is still the worst assisting player on the team but again maybe that's because of playing on his wrong foot and whatnot um as for the rest of it like those are the sort of guys that I'm impressed with um players coming through at the moment let's just sort it by uh, current ability so we can sort of see what's going on with that so Dosanya maybe there's hope for him like he's got good stats in good areas uh we haven't seen enough of him to really make a decision but I do think there's something for him in this team Yazzie still has some de he appears in decent areas for us. Coutinho is a midfielder, so we can ignore that. Jurkovic is a midfielder as well. Peric is gone. Vera's just so far off the pace these days. Brendan's gone. Nigor um, is 34 years old and retiring at the end of the season. Peter Andrews. So, unless we've got any more, we do probably have a few more. Yeah, I mean, Surgord. I think that what we've got is fine, but it would be nice to see someone maybe come in with a good personality and some good potential. I, I don't know. Like, I'm happy with the strike force as it is. Um, I mean, hey, maybe if we turn professional, I could actually sign someone. I have no idea who I'd sign um, because it would cost us loads of money. So there's that aspect of it. But I've got to stop talking about it as if we're going to turn pro. We are turning pro, but not yet. Uh, probably not even until next summer. Next summer is going to be a very, very fun one because we'll be doing a lot of scouting and whatnot. But this year is mainly just going to be about consolidating ourselves, uh, trying to improve on last year and yet yeah, just improving. So yeah. If you've reached this point in the episode, uh, if you could write Ford Focus in the comments, because that will confuse people. That's the word of the day. The word of the day is Ford Focus. And also, be sure to tell me about your favourite moments of this season, your favourite goals, your favourite player. Who do you think is the player of the season? Best goal? Underrated? Overrated? Toure? Um, yeah, who do you think is the most underrated player? Let me know in the comments as well. All this stuff. Tell me. Tell me your thoughts about these things. Um, I can't action on them, obviously, because obviously this is coming out on Monday, and I'm recording this on Friday. Um, so yeah, but 
uh, yeah, if you have enjoyed this episode, do be sure to drop a like on these videos because if you, yeah, it just shows me that you want me to keep making them, basically. Uh, and if you're new to the channel and this is the first video you've seen, do be sure to hit the subscribe button as well. And I will join you tomorrow for what is going to hopefully be a very, very fun summer and one that I'm a little bit unsure of because there's all sorts of nonsense could happen. But anyway, I'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much for watching. Bye-bye.